Thanks to Charles Lee Homes, who are an independent estate agency for first-time buyers, home movers and downsizers. They offer no sale, no fee, no tie-in or withdrawal period. They're open seven days a week and always use beautifully presented images for your home. We live in unprecedented times, of course. Never has there been a pandemic that's closed down football like this in the history of the sport. So I suppose the question now becomes, when and how do we go back? And what will football look like afterwards? Will it quickly return to maximum capacities again? Will everybody want to go back? Will everybody be able to go back? Well, I've been speaking to a, a lot of different people and this is the second part of the video version of the Forever Blue podcast, which you can download, of course, from SoundCloud and subscribe for free. This video version, and by ringing the bell or clicking on the bell on the YouTube channel, that gives you an alert every single time that I post a video up here, we can see the debate on how and when and will football ever be right again. Uh, later on, you'll see two ex-City players, uh, Jim Melrose and Colin Hendry, some of the Forever Blue squad and lots and lots of different views. I'd love to hear your views, see your views as well. So feel free to comment. So how and when and will football ever get back to normal? I initially disagreed with football coming back when it did. Because at the time I was having a lot of raw issues family-wise, you know, because I've got a very sick granddaughter who's got uh, blood cancer and stuff. So, and I couldn't see her. And because of that, I... I disagreed with football coming back when it did. I understand why it's come back because for a lot of people's mental health, it obviously works. Um, and I, I do watch it now, but I don't, I don't feel the same excitement with an empty ground. Um, letting fans back in, I can't see fans ever coming back into grounds, not like it used to be until there's vaccines. And how long is that going to be? You, you could be, you might never get a vaccine. Then then what happens? Um, and he, even if they let them in, say, I don't know, I don't, I've not looked to the figures, but is it something like 14,000 they might let in City if, if whatever? Even if you did that, I don't know if they'll manage it under the stands in the bars and in the toilets and things like that. Um, I'd be slightly concerned about it, but. Um, that's for other people to, to make their minds up about. But I wouldn't, I'd feel safe to an extent if I'm sat, you know, two metres away from people. And um, But I wouldn't like to be in a, you know, as you're leaving the ground or, like you say, going to toilets and things like that, I'd feel wary of, of uh, my surroundings. But everyone's different, aren't they? Some people are really taking this seriously and other people are so blase about it. Um, I know this is I'm... a hypothetical question, but if if we were in a position where that vaccine had happened and every everything was safe again, yeah, do you think that everybody would just instantly return? We'd be back to full crowds again, even with the magic vaccine, or do you think this long period of time without being able to attend games, the, the monetary issues that might come from unemployment, um, yeah. you know, the, the, the reality of the cost of what football is, do you, do you think it's changed people? Has it changed you? Um, I think it will change a lot of people um, because it's like me. I, I work away all week. Um, I don't see my wife and my daughter hardly. Monday to Friday, I see them at weekends. That's that's my family time. And even though I don't look really old, <laughs> I've got five grandkids. Um, you know, um, and weekend is, is like, it's family time. And I was spending my weekend at the football. So, and now... Because of what's happened, I've, I'm, you know, I'm spending time at home with the family, and even though I've only, I've only seen my granddaughter a couple of times since all this kicked off, purely because of her condition, and everyone's scared to death of because uh, she's had bone marrow and all that lot. Um, so people are, 
and now you're spending time with a family and, and realizing it's an important time spending it with a family. And, the, and other people have started finding other hobbies. And um, so I think it will be a slow process. I think initially they, they might flood back on the first game, but I'm not so sure long term. I think this might do a lot of damage to football. Um, because as you realised before all this kicked off, there are always empty seats at, um, at the Etihad anyway, which that used to drive me mad because there were a lot of people, rightly or wrongly, they had season tickets and they might live abroad or whatever and only come when they can. So that seat's empty and it don't look good on telly, does it? And, you know, the, all the old jokes of empty, I don't know, that rubbish, it, that used to drive me up the wall, but no, I think it's it's going to be an hard road to come back from all this, I think. Um, I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> I think football going forward is, is going to be a major disappointment for a lot of people because during whether we find a vaccine today, tomorrow, next year, I think there's at least a two to three years chance of football not being the way we know it as you know, sitting next to each other, having a laugh with our friends, not wearing masks. Um, people losing their jobs may not be able to go to football. People, are, you know, it's such an impact on the whole game itself. I mean, but the way I look at it, I, you know, I work in the transportation business and um, I look at the aeroplanes, for instance. You know, everybody's sat on an aeroplane with a mask on, right? That's not social distancing. And they're up there for two to three to four to five to seven hours at, at a trip. And I think for the financial impact it's going to have on some of the smaller clubs, they must find a way, whether it's a row, then a gap of five rows, then a row and a gap of five rows, and, and you know, to, to introduce it back into to, to going live. Because personally, I, I, I'm ready to go back tomorrow. I understand COVID-19 is an impact on most people's lives. It's affected most people. Um, but to me, the game's going to take a massive, you know, how many people are going to be allowed in a corporate box? Well, I mean, I use City as an example. The Tunnel Club. What's going to happen to the Tunnel Club? Because you can't have 10 people in a Tunnel Club. It's financially not viable. The Tunnel Club was there as a, as a money maker. Um, and, and it's things like that. And I think the game's going to take at least possibly two to three years to recover. Maybe longer. With that seeming but overly feel... dramatic, do you think football as we knew it is finished, or do you think it will eventually be just as we remember it? it? Eventually, will be like that. But like I say to you, the time scale is worrying. Two to three years. You know, as you know, I've got my family that we all sit together, uh, and we're a bubble. So, but we'll go and we'll sit together. But what guarantees me that people are going to be sat next to me, or is there going to be a gap again, or is my seat going to change? The only thing that'll ever destroy me from going to City is it's like my home. Them seats have been my home for years, from Main Road, like for like, to, to the Etihad, like for like. I don't want to sit anywhere else. I want to sit. It's not when I come home, the kids know Dad's sofa. That's Dad's sofa. <laughs> that's Dad's sofa. Get off Dad's sofa. And that's how I feel about City. I think it's going to be a long time before we can, um, you know, hug and do what we, we, we've always... Oh no, when we score, it's a natural instinct. You're going to stand up and go, you know, and touch the next person or, you know, high-five the person next to you. Is that all going to stop? You know, we just don't know. If you're talking about going to the match, to a Premier League game or a Champions League game, I think we're talking about uh, a long time before we'll have full stadium. So if that isn't everybody's cup of tea... And in my case, it's not. Um, I think that, you know, having a space to yourself with uh, no one near you for uh, for, for two metres or whatever um, isn't much fun. And then getting in and out of the ground, all the, all, all the measures that are going to have to be taken. I'm not, I'm not really sure I'm up for that, to be honest. Um, I think I'm probably going to find other ways to enjoy sport in the interim period. Um, you know, watching my local rugby team, I want to watch some maybe of the, the lower league teams in, in soccer. Maybe take up fishing. You never know. But I think what people are going to do is they're going to find something else uh, because it won't be what you what you were enjoying way back when. Um, whether that ultimately means that you you lose 
I think the the passion for it, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think I'm pretty fickle and I think I'd go back tomorrow if we could go back to March, to be honest. Um, that wouldn't, that, I don't think that's a, that's a question. So do you not think that there will be, given the financial implications of people losing jobs and the uncertainty of, of paying for season tickets and things like that will affect crowds? you think that there will be, the second that that magic moment happens when the vaccine is distributed to us all, that there'll be 55,000 at no. the Etihad and 76,000 at Old Trafford and it'll just be like that. No, because I think a lot of people are going to be thinking twice about whether they want to be vaccinated. They're going to wait and see. Um, so I think you're really only talking about the hardcore making every effort they can if they're, if they're physically able and, and economically uh, sound to, to be able to do that. So the idea of full stadiums, I think, is a long way away. Ian. Football, as we know it, is over. Oh, is that too dramatic? No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, we even just the, the game on Sunday. I, I was as much as I could be engaged in the game. You know, just really wanted to to watch what was a great game of football with things that annoyed me and things that I thought were great. So, if that's what football is for now, that's what it'll have to be. I think there's going to be a natural cull, and I think this natural cull has been, um, been we've been waiting for this for a long time. There are a number of clubs who are within the pyramid system who just exist and actually contribute nothing to the game. Um, so either they go out of business, or you form a Premier Leagues one and two, and the team and, and the teams that are in those two leagues should adopt a smaller team where they can send their academy kids out to play proper football because a lot of these kids now uh, academy football for me is boys club football when I was a boy when I was 16 when I get into Patrick Thistle's first team you never see that happening now wee boy Foden oh, great player but he is one of very few who actually make that step up from academy into into the first team what is, what's, what's Phil now 20 when I was 20 I had 140 games under my belt. Okay, it was a different era. I accept that. But you know, I just think that the, the academy system is not encouraging young players to come through quickly. Um, you have to put them in an environment where they're playing with men. And for me, a lot of academy footballers are just young boys. You know, that's quite a controversial statement you've made there. I know you played at, at Macclesfield and uh, you were involved potentially in a, in a takeover at Stockport County at, at one time. And, and I know you've, you've, I think you played for Kurz and Ashton as well, uh, right at the end of your career. And you, you're talking about clubs, you know, if they go, they go, uh, which it, it's hard to listen to that as somebody who cares about those clubs. But that's your feeling, is it? I, I'm not talking about your Ashton, your Kurz and Ashtons, and, your, and the, I'm talking about your, your, your league clubs in Division 1 and 2. That's where the cull's got to be, because they're directly involved in the pyramid. You know, down the line, you have to... The Premier League for many years, um, and I've said this to you before, Ian, that football is like any business. To get to the top, you need to start at the bottom. There, are, there is no bottom now. Even in Scotland, grassroots football is virtually non-existent. They took a system that was working well and broke it. You know, Scotland produced a lot of players in the 70s and the 80s. Now there's very few players that are Scottish bred that play in English Premier League of any note. Um, whereas in the 80s, I mean, Manchester City was full of Scots. Tommy Hutchison, Asa, um, you know. And I just think that they should be, and if they're going to invest in anything, they should invest in grassroots and get kids playing again. You know, because that, that, that talent pool is shrinking every year. You know, as you well know, there's less than 1% make it to play professional football or get a chance to play professional football. But 1% of 4 million kids is a lot better than 1% of a million kids. And that's where I think that football should, they should really look at the structure and start investing. Not coaching kids, but letting them play football. Let them, let them have a love of playing so that they have the necessary skills to make that next step. Instead of taking kids in at 5, 6, 7 and 8 into professional clubs, nonsense. None. If, you, if you're suggesting that, that Macclesfield falling by the wayside, Berry falling by the wayside, and on others as well in, in Leagues 1 and 2, that's really going to hurt people who support those teams and people it who is. work at those what, teams. What, I'm saying, what I said was 
the, the, you should form two Premier Leagues, and every Premier League club should adopt one of these kid, one of these clubs. And they should be financially responsible because the connection between Macclesfield and, and, and Berry is impropriety or financial shenanigans by by the owners. And you know, and I'm not saying anything happened dishonestly, but the club wasn't run properly, and therefore they got to a stage where they were foreclosed because they either owed the H HMRC money or they owed creditors money, but the bills weren't being paid. Now, what, you know, you have to look at that, and that will happen to a number of clubs because a lot of the small clubs depend on the three or the four thousand people that come through the gate to keep them going, and that's not happening. In the bigger picture, then, do you see a day not too far away when your beloved Rangers and hopefully Manchester City, who I know you cared about when you were a player there as well, um, will survive, will have full capacity crowds again, people hugging and, and everything back to, to normal? Or do you think those days either will be a long time coming or may never even return? I, I think this virus is around, around for a long time. And I think the only way we're going to beat it is to is to understand it, understand how it behaves, and more importantly, understand how it transmits between people. And and you know, and the obvious answer here is is that and it, I, funny I mentioned this today that the way forward is for people to come into the ground with their hand sanitised and wear a mask because the infection goes in through your respiratory tract. So if you keep your hands clean and you go away from your mouth and you don't cough in anybody's direction, then that is that is going to be the way forward. But the problem I've got at the moment, there's so many experts giving conflicting reports on how to deal with this. There's no uniformity. So there's not an easy answer, Ian. Yeah, we're part of the same. I think we're part of a couple of WhatsApp groups. And, you know, the Blues and Business group, um, somebody mentioned about having the games being back live to the Etihad and having an ex-pro in there talking, an ex-City player in there talking about the game and, and I thought that would have been done by now. I actually thought, you know, where the the for for a bit of income for the football club and, and generating the hubbub around the stadium as well as so there is some people coming in and coming out. And because the, these these rooms are big enough to accommodate social distancing and etc. So it's possible and, and I, I just thought that would have been done by now. But it's gonna take a long time. I mean, I'm watching games. Um, in Europe at the minute, in Germany, uh, in France, games, I watch a lot of the, the French football in the German Bundesliga, and they've got fans in, and they're all separate, they're all split up from in distances. But the thing about who, who gets in and who doesn't get in, you know, you, just because you pay more money shouldn't really allow you to have the choice over the man that has been and followed his team for, 30, 40 years, who's paid the same. He's got this, well, since seatings came in, he's had the same seat, and it might be the bog standard seat price, but he's been that he's been in that seat for 30 years, and why should he be deemed to be the one that's not getting in to see the game, whereas somebody that's prepared to pay three times the amount? So you've got that issue, I think. That, but it's the fans, that, well, the games, I mean... God only knows how a footballer can play. I mean, my son's playing tonight for St. Johnson against Kelty Hearts in the Cup, and there's no crowd going to be there. And I said to him, how have you felt between... He said, it's great. It's just like... It's like a pre It's like a pre-season match, but as soon as the game starts, you realise your adrenaline takes over that you're in a proper match. There's just no crowd. There's no... There's nothing from the sidelines where an ooh and an ah, except through the tannoys and through Sky TV, they've tried to... They've tried to, to, to put that forward, but it's just not the same. And unless, unless you know, and it's this is completely out with a football, um, unless we have a vaccine and it comes along pretty soon, you know, the, the country and the world is going to be a different place for quite a while. And it's, it's sad. It's sad. And, and again, I mean, the government coming away from football, the government have got the problems because I'm not a politician. I'm not a politician. But it doesn't matter who's in charge at this minute in time. You're going to do some things right and you're going to do something wrong. And the other people, the other, the other parties are all going to jump on and say, we should have done this, we should have done that. Because it's easy to say that, isn't it? You know, it's easy to say that in football as well, as I should have picked this team, I should have selected them. And hindsight's a great thing. But um, it's, it, is, it is sad. It is sad. And 
not see, it's not around the corner. That's the disappointing thing. It's not going to be, well, certainly not going to be this side of Christmas, not now, I wouldn't think, because there are issues in Scotland and there are issues in, Scot- in England as well as, where um, they have semi-lockdowns and some of the areas are tightening up even more. It's just surreal. It's, it's, it's crazy. And, and as I say, I mean, players playing in, in that sort of arenas, uh, situations, it's got to be different. It's got to be far, far different. And, you know, again, I know that the TV companies that are covering the games are all trying to recreate a bit of an atmosphere within the grounds and even the stadiums themselves, the retrospective stadiums, they're all trying to bring the sound through the tannoy for the sake of the, for the people watching the game at home who have got the choice of switching it off or switching it on. I'd rather have it on because it's a little bit more like real, realistic, I would have said. Um, but for the players there, it's, it's, it's a, again, you've got something coming through the tannoy when you're playing football and it's a noise of a crowd. And it's and as, as my son had said to me, he said it's nothing like a crowd, because it sounds different, but it is a crowd coming through a tannoy. And it, but they've got to adapt to that. You know, it's it's they're in that situation at the minute. The players, um, for the fans, it's just so disappointing. And I mean, I work in week to a lot of people in the, in in, um, in a lot of different countries. Was the Saturday afternoon either at the radio? at three o'clock, listen to their team playing away from home or at the stadium of the team they support. That was their working week and the icing on the cake was the game at 3pm on a Saturday. And we know as well that 3pm games are now few and far between because of TV rights and everything else, but they still had something to look forward to at the end of the week. In Germany, they have fans in the stadium, in some stadiums. I watched the Dortmund game the other day, there were fans. I watched the game, I think it was Hoffenheim, against Bayern Munich, they were fans. So it all depends on how the country manages this crisis will determine how fans get back in the stadium. I think the game against Sevilla in the Champions League in the Super Cup, there were fans in Europe, the European game. So it all depends on how we manage um, the situation with COVID-19. I, I don't understand how I, I heard that in the UK that uh, people are allowed to go to the cinema and in closed space, but I'm not allowed to go to the stadium. Well, how does that make any sense? Right. I mean, here in the U.S., we are allowed to play football under 12, under 16, under 18. They actually play because it's open air. There are rules that we have to abide by. Right. Social distancing, wearing the mask, you no know, handshakes, hand sanitizers, temperature checks. We have all those things. We still play week in, week out. I have practice four times a week, but I'm masked. I'm coaching. So the rules that we have to abide by and those rules are in place. Absolutely have fans at the stadium. Maybe not, maybe not 50,000, maybe 5,000, maybe 10,000. Right. And gradually increase that over time. But there has to be a point where we have fans back in the stadium. Life has to go on in a measured in a respectful, in a safe way that keeps uh, the clubs up, keeps fans engaged. If not, we'll go back to what I saw in Star Trek two years ago. Right. Which is basically having a, a I saw a, a, a Star Trek episode where they had two wrestlers somewhere in the galaxy and was beamed across the whole galaxy with no fans. It was all virtual. Who wants to see that? Who wants to see that? No one. So for me, fans have to come back in a safe, respectful way that gets people engaged, gets them involved, has get back the fan experience, have people come through the turnstiles to create revenue, keep jobs, and open up the economy again safely. When's the next time, Carl, you realistically think you're going to be sat in the Etihad Stadium with 55,000 there watching the game? I don't think it would be till 2022 season, in my opinion. I think two things going to happen. Either we get the vaccine, we get a vaccine, we either get a solution to cure the, the virus or it's herd immunity. It's one of those three. But I think it's going to be 2022 until we actually get people back 100% in, in the stadiums. It's, it's going to be a long journey. It all depends on how the governments manage this crisis. If we all do what we're required to do, Ian, which is social distance, wash your hands, keep safe, I think we can overcome it. Germany has fans back in the stadium. France has fans back in the stadium. Why can't we do it in England and the US? We can. Even the NFL, Ian, has some fans back in the stadium. It may not be 100,000, 10,000, 5,000. They're back in the stadium, in some stadiums. We can do it. And I just hope that when we come out of this coronavirus, whether it's in a year, two years, um, that, that we're going to have clubs to go and watch. Like I say, Premier League, yes, we will. Lower down the uh, divisions, 
I worry for them because I, I saw at close quarters what happened at, at, at Berry and Bolton. And it's very easy, if you're not being run correctly, it's very easy for, for football clubs to, uh, to, to get into dire straits. And, and that's my main, my main fear. I, th- I feel that the, the football, I think we'll still fill the stadiums. I think we'll still have fans uh, filling the stadiums and I think that um, even if the product is, is slightly different, I think people's natural um, ability to, to adapt to, um, to differences in their sport will see them gradually get used to uh, the new product and um, they'll continue to go. You can never underestimate football fans' loyalties. I mean, they're born with it and they're not going to lose it. One or two may and they may make the news because that's the story. Um, but you'll always fill football stadiums. You know, 99% of fans, they just, just can't leave it alone. My worry is that there'll be an older generation who, at the moment, are possibly still staying indoors, frightened to go out, um, even though they're allowed to go to some places. There are people who've lost their jobs, um, whose income has been affected, and people who, after a long break of not watching football in stadiums, will think, hang on a minute, this is, this is better than actually going to the stadium because it doesn't cost me a fortune. I don't have to pay £10 to park my car. I don't have to be packed on, on a tram or a bus. It's, I don't get soaking wet. I don't have to worry about leaving five minutes before the end. I just worry a little bit that the habit's been broken and that the, the magic of, of attending football has gone. But you're more on the, on the optimistic side, are you? I am, Ian, yeah. Um, I think there's nothing like the feeling of, of match day uh, of waking up and you know knowing it's a big it's a big game and and there's only one place to be and, and that's at the game it's it's just magical and it'll always be that way I do get what, what you're saying about the older generation yeah of course you know the older generation may be um, a little less keen to to go out um, especially with coronavirus and the older generation that are the, are the most susceptible but even afterwards, uh, they may get set in the ways and, and find that they prefer to watch it in, in a pub. Um, from a City perspective, I'm sure I read a statistic that said that, and, and if I'm wrong on this, then I apologise, but I'm sure I read that um, there is uh, their average age of City season ticket holders is older than any other fans in the country, probably because they stayed through all the bad times. And when the good times eventually came with Manuel Pellegrini and and uh, Roberto Mancini and now with Pep Guardiola, that the time when they would have naturally perhaps stopped going to games, they weren't going to stop, were they? So I wonder if we're going to see a, a mass exodus of, of the older fans. Well, I don't know how we've got um, old fans, Ian, as we were only invented in 2008. So obviously we must have younger fans, of course, you know. But seriously, um, yeah, we do, we do have um, an older fan base. Um, but the whole of football, um, or Premier League football, the fan base is older. I mean, again, I, like you, read a, a year or two ago that, um, that the average age of, of Sintic and Old was not only at City, but, but, but in, in, in the Premier League, was, was in the 50s. Um, and in the 1970s, aged 50s, uh, in the 1970s, the average age was something like 18 or something like that. Um, so, you know, the, it seemed that I think the idea of that story, um, the thread of that story was that it's the same people who have been following their teams throughout the last 40, 50 years. Um, now, cities being a bit older, that's, that's news to me. I, I didn't realise that. Um, I don't know. I can't. I just can't see people not going. I mean, if, if we have got, you know, fans of in the 50 age group, they've they've been loyal since they were well, 10 years old, 15 years old. I can't see them not going. I also can't see um, us not getting new supporters as well. I mean, you know, we've we everybody wants to support a winning team, um, and also the majority of people start supporting the team that they're their dads and their uncles support so it just stands to reason that you know we'll, we'll, we'll keep a flow of, uh, of supporters coming through I mean where I live in Radcliffe you know you go around in the streets or you go you go to Asda um, you see Manchester City shirts on kids you see them all, all over the place so I have no fears that we 
know, that we will keep a, a regular fan base. We've we've had a fantastic fan base throughout every period of, of history. Uh, we're one of only three or four clubs who have had this serious high fan base in every period of history. Um, I think Liverpool have, Arsenal have, um, that, 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 uh, Everton possibly. So there's no reason to think that that's not going to continue if it's, if it's happened since you know since the 1900s. People will still be scared. I mean, I'm scared about certain things. Like um, I've not you know gone and seen friends properly. I've not gone to a pub or anything like that. I've obviously gone back to work. Um, I've had no choice but to go back to work. Um, but obviously as a nursery we have had to do everything COVID safe and fingers crossed we have done the best that we can for the children that we that we look after and also for our staff um, but yeah there is certain things I'm scared about but I hope that like every other business out there that Manchester City will be able to do it in a COVID safe and I hope that all other football teams will especially for the ones who are in the lower leagues, they desperately need fans back, they desperately need the money back in or else they're not going to survive. And fingers crossed, people do return. I would hope that people do return. A lot of people, you know, are fed up of staying in and they need, they need the things that they like to do. They need that back in their lives. So I do hope that a big majority do return to the ground. Do you sit there, well, lie there asleep at night dreaming of being in a big crowd again, jumping up and down, celebrating a goal, hugging everybody, which seems at the moment so far away, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, hugs is a big, big thing. I'm, I am a huggy person. Um, I do like hugging people. Um, and it's really weird because obviously I can't hug my friends. I've not really been able to hug my family, but... The children at nursery still need hugs and we've had to give hugs. You can't not do that. You can't not hug a child. So um, at the moment, I'm just getting hugs off my little babies at nursery. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do miss the camaraderie of football. I've, I've made some really good friends um, thanks to football. And I am missing my little group that I have around me. Um, there's an a elderly couple who sit in front of me and um, I've not had a chance to find out if they're all right or anything. And, I, and sometimes I do think about them and how they're getting on because, um, you know, especially at times like this. But, yeah, I've, I've really missed my little group of people. You know, me and my dad go together. That's me and my dad thing. Me and my dad have the football and me and my mum have concerts. So with me and my mum have not been able to go concerts and me and my dad haven't been able to go to the football. And, yeah, it, it's it's awful that, you know, we, we are missing our little group of people. So, yeah, I can't wait to go back to see everyone. And, yes, give everyone a hug. <laughs> my thanks to Charles Louis Holmes for the support for this video and lots of other videos that I produce on this channel. Thank you.